All right. So I haven't done this kind of long form thing for a little while, but I wanted to for here because I finally finished chapter 18, which is, you know, I finished chapter 16, 17, and 18 all last night. And I had one of those things where, you know, when you focus on something too long, you get really invested in it kind of in a short span of time. And then you start having dreams and things. You start thinking you have earbuds in and you have the book in front of you. And then you kind of wake up and you've been going along this continuation of the adventure, but none of that happened. So that has been, that happened to me last night uh, as I finished, or, or just after I finished sub book three. But before that, I had written down about 25 things that happened right at the end that I am super excited about. Finally, we are getting some of these big convergences that I've been waiting for in this series. I'm, I'm just so excited. Okay, so this isn't going to be in any order. Don't know if I mentioned that. Uh, but I have these 25 or so things, and I, I'll try not to be too wordy on any of them. No promises depending on how long this video is, but I am so excited. So starting off, we finally are getting these duels with Rulad that we've been waiting for for so long. I was waiting for this to maybe happen at the end of Midnight Tides, although you figure it wasn't going to happen because they got to go out and find champions. And finally, we have these champions. We also have uh, the Malazan Empire, that is coming kind of as their own champion. You know, they're not going to go one soldier at a time. They're going to just challenge Rulad. And they are on this mission against the Edur, not really understanding yet what is really happening in in uh, at Lether. The Lethery are really the ones that are involved. And it's just, it's just crazy. It's so cool. Oh, I got to write something else down so I don't forget it. Uh, so we're having those. We they have the order. Okay, we have the order going on. They've been watching people duel, so sometimes they give an extra day or two to uh, figure out. You know, he's going to die. He's going to come back. He'll powerful. He'll die again. Come back more powerful, and then he'll finally get him. And they are giving three or four days to Karsa at the end, near the end of this line, just before Akarium. And uh, they figure by three or four days, he'll finally, Rulad will finally get Karsa. Can't wait to see how the heck that goes. And then Ikarium, they can't give, they have no idea because he doesn't duel. But they know that he, he's this ultimate cold kind of... Uh, character where he he doesn't they don't know they don't know just how powerful he is some people i think maybe know that he's potentially this this one god i mean when he stepped foot off of the off of the boat onto the land the very land trembled it's just so exciting so that order is set i thought that was maybe coming in Midnight Tides, but they needed to go out and collect champions and things. So finally, we are getting that. We have Karos in Victad, who has approached Tribun, Tribun Null, who really is kind of the one in charge, this nasty, terrible person with the really delicate hands. And uh, he has said that he has done all these things, and that he is the, some of the reason for the calamity, the economic calamity going on. And uh, that he is the richest man in Lether. Now, he has, he wants the Edur. He wants to get rid of them. He wants to do this cleansing of the Edur, meaning, you know, ethnic cleansing. Uh, he is also wanting you know i don't think he wants to be at the head as the visual crown in the way that rulad is like he knows how things goes 
he wants to be one of the ones who really influences uh, and and is in control of this spread of the empire because that's where the money is. So uh, very excited to see where that goes. And I don't, I don't, yeah, you'll, we'll just see. We'll just see. It seems like they've done this many times before where they kind of give people these positions in the kingdoms and things that they gobble up, but then they just either cleanse them out or they adopt them in. But these Edur, he, he figures we got to get rid of these guys. He's also totally obsessed with this bug uh this bug uh spider puzzle thing that has come from tehol and also obsessed with finally he's going to finally make that that uh arrest with tehol and we'll talk about that later but holy smokes uh we have the sengar parents drowning um and and rulad has just you know, he's already just, he's already lost his mind, but he is not listening to any Edur that come in because he is convinced the Lethary people have, you know, these, these guys, his handlers, I guess you could call it, had convinced him and poisoned his mind into thinking that all the, all the Edur are out to get him and, and probably some would be. But I think most of these people want to, I mean, they want to strip Rulad of, I mean, they're not going to take off the coins, but the metaphorical chains and the metaphorical leather coin, leathery coins that are in him, uh, they, they want that to be finished, to, to be ended, get their son back, these, these two parents. So they sent him down. And it reminds me, now it gives new light on Trull's uh, shorning. He was sent down and chained to drown. Uh, it, it reminds you again of, of Karsa and uh, Torvald being chained, even though that wasn't the Lethry people, but them being chained kind of in this, in this water. And now we had these other e doer that have been chained uh, below, and it totally gives new light. Next time I read this series, it's going to be so different, and it's super tragic. It's so tragic, not even just for the parents, and it clearly is tragic for them, but it also is tragic for that Sengar family. It is tragic for Rulad. It's it's just terrible. Uh, we have the errant who has been kind of working with Featherwitch, has been doing all these different deals. Um, and he has trapped Bug. And that's one player down. So he's trapped Bug into this altar. He's done this ritual where he's trapped him. Uh, and, and it's just, oh, I better write down another thing. Actually, I won't write that down. I'll just mention also... Um, so that's one major thing, and I love Bug. Everyone loves Bug. I, I defy people to read this series and not love Bug. Um, we also have this moment where the Lethary people have gone into where this, where Clip and these other Tistandi were, where, where Silchus and these people were. They have gone in, but Clip and them have, have left with Saren and Udinus and Fear. And they have come in and they have killed all of these people right around this dark altar. They tried to desecrate the altar, but it seems like more than that, it really was like a, this blood offering um, upon the altar or around the altar. In the same way that Kapistan was this, it, it's like the whole city became this altar and then there was this this uh, nasty building that was kind of uh, I I was it was it grabbed by uh, Bokalane and, and Corbel Broach first, but then Krull 
and it's just it's interesting to same see those same sorts of things then we have clip who's spinning this chain flipping it back and forth with the onyx stones or the rings and it opens up and it is this portal into this other area and finally it looks like we're going to confront scavendari blood eye and what is he going to do um when he sees silchus and what is animanta rake going to do and what is if he comes around and it's just we're finally getting to some of that uh let's see so we have hanan mosag who's sort of the head honcho still he hasn't given up he hasn't given up he's still this warlock king he is the cedar he is not trusted by rulad or the his handlers i guess i just i keep calling them calling them that he is still after this sword he is not going down without a fight he has sent he's done this this ritual with bruthen where he's kind of like uh he's killed bruthen but it's in this it's immediate immediately done he's kind of i kind of think as of it as this inception like thing where he is sending him off into this other realm kind of like in a realm like all these other dead people are just wandering around but they're unable to really uh touch things unless they are like a, a part of a part of animals and things like that in the way that uh cuddle and, and that other uh talorist or whatever um I, i'm a little bit confused about them but it's like he's sending him into this other realm to to start working for him and he's not going down without a fight we have tayhol and janeth finally arrested by uh by tanel i wonder how that's going to go um you, i have to think i have to think that in the end though um tayhol will have the upper hand in all this and i have to think that also probably tavor will have the upper hand in all this but who knows who knows we have Ublala's chickens, which was hilarious. That was just before this. Ublala's chickens and Tehol and Janeth and well, it's actually it's actually Tehol's chickens, but Ublala's been plucking them alive, and he has one inside of this pillow that he's keeping for later, and he's been eating them head first, and it, like it's a hilarious scene right before, right before all this. Anyway, uh, I want to know what happens when Akarium finally does his thing uh i get big time anime vibes with that guy where it's like I, I how powerful is he what happens when he finally uh does something but i mean we've seen we've seen troll kind of step into his path and troll's still around so so what's going to happen oh and that reminds me i haven't even written this down we had Saren um, being in an argument with with Udinus, and then she kind of summons Hull like in her mind, but it's actually like happening where he's choking Udinus, and then Troll shows up and kind of batters him, and so we have fear and people seeing this. It's not just in her mind. They're seeing this. So really there is this connection between these other realms. And, and again, I will I will talk about that. There's a really amazing scene. Uh, I think this was in chapter 18, but there's this amazing scene we'll talk about. It's that one with Hedge and Emroth. And that is one where we finally start to get a little bit deeper into what is going on. Finally um we have red mask who's definitely this hot iron person and he is uh he's crazy and wild and we have talk on that side um they're finally engaging with the leather 
the Lethry, I guess. We have the Malazans using their Maranth munitions, which is always exciting. Uh, fiddlers there, they use these Maranth munitions against those... Uh, uh, now off the top of my head, I forget the names, but those demons that were in chap or in Midnight Tides that were just kind of... There's a couple that are just chilling in a house, and they they throw these munitions at them right at the head and it still doesn't like break their head open and things like that they uh not many things can withstand that so i'm excited to see what happens as they start kind of pushing through into this area and i was kind of annoyed when they showed up because i was really invested in the stuff over here but this other front is is just so exciting we have tavor already speaking with some of the people from the Lether, uh, the Lethry area, the, this from Lether, uh, with the shake person with twilight. And she is from this tribe who kind of, uh, guarded the coast. Remember that's kind of a sacred space for some people between the unknown and the known, the sea and the land. And they would be along this Western coast. And I believe, uh, even though she doesn't know of of all of their history, some of these other, uh, who was it? I can't remember who's the one that knew all this. Dead smell, or whatever, bottle. Um, he, uh, they would be there to kind of gather up some of the Kachain Shamal that would come from the water, the babies that weren't claimed or, or something, claimed by the matron things like I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how that went but it's interesting because they are already she's already making deals with people or seeing what their intent is if the Malazans were to help out what what is their intent you know when when Rome would come through or when Persia would come through or when Egypt would come through or where Babylon would come through or you know they would come through and yes they would rule but they would set up these vassal kings. And that's, uh, that's what would sometimes get people in trouble. It's like, you better, you better, Egypt might come in and, and say, you better, you better work for us now, right? You better send taxes and things like that to us. And then Babylon might start to get more powerful and then they stop doing the taxes to Egypt, send it to Babylon, send it up to wherever. And that gets them in trouble. So she is saying, what are your intentions if we help you set up this kingdom? You know, re reclaim your kingdom. And her brother, her half-brother is thinking other things. Anyway, it's very interesting, interesting to see that. Because in the first book, we had uh, the Malazan Empire just taking over. Lacines like, go take them over. Uh, and so they're having the siege and da, da 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 Um, book two is, is them rebelling and things, but it's, it's nice to get this really early look on them literally arriving on the coast. Uh, we've had all these different looks, uh, you know, it's this, it's this third way or this third kind of, uh, this third look in, in this kind of you know, situation. But of course, Tavor is sort of a wild card right now in that she's kind of, it's hard to understand really where her motivations are in some ways. Okay. Uh, we have these Rautos, you know, Rautos is artifacts that are still kind of around. We haven't had closure on that. I, I'm sure we're going to. Uh, I assume those have to be made from or used by Ikarium, if I had to guess, because he's one of these ones probably from the first empire, if I would have to guess. Uh, it seems like that's implied. He's like this one, the, the, the god that they are worshiping. Uh, very excited to see, to see if, if that is the case. And I think it has to do with time. What happens when he finally gathers these things and, and do, does time kind of 
get all funky? Do we actually go back in time? Um, I, I'm waiting to see if it, what in what ways time is utilized because it seems it seemed from from Dead House Gates when we met Ikarium that time really you know it wasn't just that he had forgotten kind of who he was as he was walking through time. I'm waiting to see where that goes and I'm waiting to see if Mapo shows up. Uh, we have this amazing moment with Karsa grabbing Ikarium's arm, kind of confronting him and, and recognizes something in him, recognizes some Tobolkai in his parentage. So he's part Jag, part, part Jagget, part Tobolkai or part Jag. Isn't Jag already? Ha anyway, doesn't matter, but he's got some Tobolkai in him. And he recognizes that. Uh, and then he kind of backs off. But he still he still wants to be the one who destroys Rulad. Karsa wants to be. Uh, I'm just so excited about how that goes. It could be awful. It could blow up everyone. Um, but I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, we have Beak which I got to know a little bit more about that guy. It's still kind of slowly trickling in, but the stuff that is coming in is heartbreaking. He's super compelling. Uh, he talks about he has these candles within him. It's like the sorcery that burns is these are these different candles or, or something. I don't, you know, not literal candles, but it's like he is this candle of sorcery and, or, or you know, something like that. Um, and I don't know why, because he's not like one of these quick Ben people. It's like, he's this naturally born. I don't know. I don't know if that has to do with, with his upbringing, because it sounds like he had an awful upbringing. His brother took his own life. Uh, it sounds like his mother really abused him. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just feel for Beak. And I want to know more about that guy. But I feel for him a little bit in the way I felt so strongly. Or I think a lot of us feel so strongly about Squint. Um, sometimes we get these characters that they just show up. And very quickly we are... They are somebody that really makes it to our hearts. And, and this seems like one of those guys. And I wonder, I wonder if we're going to get more about these, these, what's, what's going on. I don't understand if he's just obsessed. Uh, I said that funny. If he's just obsessed with, um, sorcery and things like that, because he's getting away from this other life. Remember, we're all about this dual nature. He's like, I, I gotta get, I can't think about that other life. And maybe that has fueled this other thing, his other focus as kind of an escape for him. Um, but it's really interesting. This scene with Bug and the advocate Sleem, was that his name? That is really, really an amazing scene where the advocate Sleem is coming to kind of collect and asks how many loans he has out and they have this funny sort of interaction um where he says you know i have like 40 and i only have like two docs to my name and uh he's just super upfront about things and uh not shying away that you know this is a bad situation and i i you know i'll pay you back but aren't you aren't you being paid by the word just for being here and da, 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 you know you can add that to the total and it's just kind of hilarious and finally we're seeing some of the horror on uh and as the lethery people are starting to kind of or some of these people who who he has you know he this sleem is in between bug and these other people who want to collect finally and they're starting to see the horror of of what's actually happening and it's just amazing now we have i mentioned this scene with hedge and emroth 
And uh, we get a lot of information through that. I was kind of bored by this at the first bit, but it turned out to be one of the most amazing, amazing little storylines in this in this uh, book. Uh, and he decide, you know, he decides he's going to throw a cusser, and he doesn't know really what's going to happen, and maybe doesn't even know where the cusser came from. In the same way that Saren sort of made, uh, made Troll and uh, Hannon show up. Maybe that's sort of the same thing that Hedge is doing. It's almost like it's uh, a vivid dream that they they are inceptioned into. And we find out that maybe this is a place where the jacket created. But they don't see a bunch of jacket. And we find out that um, there are all these pathways and connections. These bridges between these different warrens and realms. Remember the ones who showed up at the start in the prologue, um, kind of as invaders. If they are not going to, you know, even if they like this place that they have created in within their dream, it's like they have created oblivion because that's what they believe. They have created these other realms. So, it, it, yeah, it, it's it's very like an afterlife after the matter of their own kind of creation is the way I initially sort of, sort of think of that um, as what's happening here. And it seems like maybe, maybe the Forkrola Sail were the ones who kind of came in and, and destroyed everything in a lot of these places. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. And maybe the purpose of the Bridge Burners is to finally cut off those paths so that people can have their own uh, their own afterlife or whatever, whatever it is, without getting invaded all the time. Um, destroy these paths, which will be a sad thing in a way, but also probably a good thing. Remember, all these things are chained together. So they can't even get away. And it also reminds me of that moment in the same chapters. I didn't write this down, but where twilight, they are in this massive storm. And then these ropes show up from these other two boats from the parish people. And the parish are just kind of walking along the ropes. I think of that as being something that's maybe a little bit of an echo of what's going on with these warrens. During the storm, you know, it, it could be that some come to help along the ropes, but some come along as pirates to destroy and, and whatnot. And I'm just seeing so much of, of that. There are this, yeah, it, it's, it's so interesting to see how that goes. And I think of the jade statues in Eboric. I want to know, you know, is he still dead? It seems like he's not totally dead. Maybe he's on to this new sort of way of being like maybe he'll wake up i don't know I, I can't recall but he is now a shield anvil so i'm excited to see where that goes if he's going to show up in this book who knows uh or if he will be for what's coming but if that's sort of what we're going to be dealing with you know this path these pathways between warrens and things if i'm on to something i am very excited for this last half of the series and it will be even more exciting than the first half uh anyway uh troll hears that you know troll and quick ben and uh on rack who i love i mean might maybe even loving on rack more than troll uh they hear the cusser hedges cusser i think because at the very end as they are and they're in Talan, where that ritual, that vow, kind of doesn't exist. And so that's why he's flesh and blood. I don't know if that's sort of the same thing with Tool. I don't remember why Tool is flesh and blood now. 
I just don't remember. Uh, I'll have to go back or you can remind me. Um, but I'm pretty sure they hear that and I'm pretty sure Quick Ben is talking to Hedge at the very end of sub book three. And that would be very cool. So finally, you know, I was waiting for them to come back in House of Chains, these bridge burners, but I wasn't exactly sure. I was kind of waiting for some kind of resurrection sort of thing uh, within the flesh. I didn't really anticipate this kind of other realm sort of spirit thing, which is still sort of a connection. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting to kind of get on board with that. It's the same way where I was so annoyed with the end of Bone Hunters and Fiddler kind of singing them off because I was like, oh, you left me hanging or you, you led me along and now we're at this wake. I thought they were going to be back, but that, I mean, within his own mind, maybe that's what was happening as this, this. Um, you know, the Tannel Spirit, the, the Tannel song, the Spirit Walker or whatever, um, did this song and then Fiddler, uh, becoming Fiddler does this song. Really, it was a beautiful moment that I was just an idiot. And there were a lot of real life things that were kind of stressful when I was reading that. So I just maybe wasn't in the great spot for, for that last part, but really it was an amazing, amazing moment. And uh, I know that I, I bugged a lot of people by how kind of annoyed I was with that moment. But I've come around. Or I'm starting to come around more, I should say. Uh, let's see. I think I've talked about everything. Oh, talk. Talk having that amazing shot. Bareback on the horse. Is just awesome. From the, I, I think that is one of the arrows that that tool made him, or he just taught him to make that. Uh, but he makes that shot and like blows up the guy's head. And uh, I just am so on board with talk, but I don't especially want him to be with, with Red Mask. I don't like Red Mask. I liked him. I understood some of, you know, I understand his motivations and that's what's so great about this series. You can understand a lot of these people's motivations like him, like Lacine, um, like the whirlwind, I guess. Uh, but I just, I, you know, I just can't get on board with him. Can't get on board with some of these people, but you can understand them, which is so interesting. And it's not supposed to be a way of, empathizing so much uh being on their team like yes they are the good guy but so many people in this series feel like they are justified in what's going on even um i said tannels uh even uh what's his face who's part even the patriotists have this thing where they feel like uh the ends justify the means of destroying all these people uh, it, it's very interesting to see how the, even they feel like they are doing something for the, the empire. And that's why this book in some ways, even though in, in some ways it has been not my favorite, uh, but as far as some of the themes that are starting to really kind of jump up, like I loved, I loved memories of ice. But then House of Chains, I started to kind of see more clearly. And that's why I love House of Chains so much. And then Midnight Tides was awesome. Very cool. Uh, Bone Hunters was just a fun ride for me. Had some really amazing standouts. Like standouts of the whole series in the Bone Hunters. But then again, Reaper's Gale is like this extra... It's like I've I've gotten to a new level and I don't know if I'm understanding things but I it's like this extra little stepping point towards these last few books if that makes sense but I'm so excited guys I'm so excited I might finish this uh this book this week 
I'm kind of in overdrive mode where I just want to see what happens. I hope this was interesting for you guys. I, I hope I didn't go too long. And let me know what I missed because there just is so much. And again, I, I went to sleep and I started to have these vivid sort of imaginations of what was going on. And I had to wake up and look at my list and, and kind of remember that, nope, nope, some of those things didn't happen. Maybe they will happen, but they're not. And I just can't wait. I can't wait for the end of this book and I can't wait to go right into Toll the Hounds. I've been thinking maybe of doing something in between again, just to once again, kind of let my, give me a chance to kind of come down from Reaper's Gale and give a chance to kind of reintroduce that hype again. I think that was good last time, but we'll see. And uh, I will talk to you guys on the next one, whenever that is.